A warm welcome to panel five, Business Models and Finance in the Age of Digitalization. Thanks for joining us. Um, before we start, I have some remarks about the questions. So if you have any questions, please write it in the QA section on the right side of Hoover. Um, we will have time after the presentations for discussion. But if you have any questions for clarification so that um, we all have a correct understanding of the presentation, please ask directly after the presentation. So this is the first, uh, the third session, sorry, um, of panel five, and it's about synergy through cooperation. Well, it is important how cooperation is defined and organized. And in this session, we have some examples of different forms of cooperation. One, is the respect of energy and Bowden Business Park realizing uh, energy symbiosis and another with focus on energy services in industrial parks in Turkey. Um, but can also be modeling in uh, the industrial production for transition um, risk assessment or um, it can be bringing together energy efficiency projects and investors through um, a certain platform, um, the Trust EE platform, which leads me to the first presentation um, with the title Bridging the Gap, a platform to connect small industrial efficiency projects with the capital markets. Um, it will be um, presented by Jürgen Fluch and he will explain to us how the platform looks like and what the steps of the trust EE projects are. The conditions of the cooperation between business owners technology, energy providers, and investors are well defined. And now a few words about Jürgen Fluch. He's a chemical engineer and head of the Department of Industrial Systems at AEE Intech, a well-known private research institute in Austria. His core topics are energy efficiency and renewable energy in industry, applying digitalization in Industry 4.0, as well as standardized pro project assessment as basis for the financing of industrial implementations in this field. Jürgen, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for this very warm uh, introduction. Welcome to everybody listening to this uh, session. Well, um, as Diane already said, I'm going to tell you something about uh, the project trustee. Um, what has been financed by the Horizon 2020 project, but is now come to an end, but uh, meaning that we are exactly at the moment where we start this as a commercial version for financing energy efficiency and renewable projects in industry. Well, um, next slide. Yeah, thanks. So why? This is a big question. Well, I think this is quite well known. In the industry, we have a huge energy demand for heating and cooling. And just looking at the figures, the facts, well, heating and cooling energy demand stands for about a fifth of the total energy demand that we have in the European Union. So quite a lot. And uh, thinking about energy efficiency and renewable projects in industry, we are quite aware that they are technically, but most important also economically, very, very feasible to be implemented. Nevertheless, we face the fact that uh, a lot of these projects are not implemented due to different reasons, but just picking out the most important ones, we are just seeing that uh, risk mitigation problems um, do not allow the industry to go for this implementation. This is also linked to high transaction costs. So if, for example, an investor, a bank has to hire experts to have a look at these projects, this increases the total investment cost significantly. And all in all, also comparing the industrial sector to, for example, the building sector, we face the fact that a lot of um, yeah, processes and procedures are not standardized in the industry sector as it has been already achieved in the building sector to a certain point. Well, um, at the same time, Okay, now I don't see the, the screen anymore, but I just will uh, keep on talking. Maybe in the middle, in the meanwhile, um, the, the, uh, the slides can be shared again, but I just will go on and say, okay, having these technical demands in the mind, we know that uh, just by energy efficiency measures, we have a huge potential to reduce the energy demand in the industry sector by up to 10%. 
And um, at the same time, also thinking about um, renewable projects potential, we know that about 50% of the total, total energy demand for heating and cooling can be covered by renewable technologies as, for example, solar thermal heat pump, photovoltaic, um, but also biomass, biogas um, um, technologies. So, um, we, are we still live? I think so, yeah. Thanks a lot for sharing the screen again. Perfect. So going to the next slide. Perfect. And I'm going to the next one. So the question is how to um, address this huge technical and also economic potential that we have in the industry. Uh, based on the experience that we have um, yeah, collected over the last 10, 15 years in this industry sector, we know that we have to come up with two solutions. On the one hand, it's a platform for a standardized project assessment, and this has to be linked automatically to a financing vehicle. What does this mean in detail? Well, the first step is to address with this approach, not only the industry or not only the technology suppliers, we have to get three stakeholders on board. On the one hand, it's the industry willing to go for this implementation, taking this step forward to decarbonize the energy supply system, fine. Second step, we need the technology suppliers also on board, meaning that we have to look for reliable um, suppliers with a huge experience in this field and by this reducing the risk also for the industry by implementing this technology. And very, very important to have also on board from the very beginning on are the investors. So they are finally the ones who want to earn money with these energy efficiency and renewable projects and they give therefore the money to these projects and so by this also make it easier for the other two to go for this implementation. Trustee, what we have achieved out of this Horizon project is we focused on wasted recovery, we focused on solar thermal, biomass and biogas, so dedicated technologies to supply industrial heating and cooling demand. And as you will see at the end, we are already doing the next steps in this field. What is this platform about? Uh, very important for all involved partners is to have a very clear, reliable process structure. So if you go to the trustee platform, the first part is to register yourself. Well, finally, you want to get some money. You want to get a report out of the trustee platform. So it's necessary to provide some basic data. Who are you? Where are you from? What do you want to do? At the same time, if you want to submit such a proposal to the trustee platform, we have to know more about the applicant who is then wants to get the money. And we have to know more about the supplier, the technology supplier and the end user. Again, where are you? What are you doing? What do you want to achieve with these technologies uh, to be implemented? For the assessment of these projects, it's important to, that you provide some basic technical and economic data. So, for example, which technology do you want to implement? Uh, which existing supply system do you want to substitute? Uh, what are the technical and economic data that you envisage to achieve by the implementation? So, what we want to see with this is to get a clear picture if the project is well designed and really ready to go for the implementation and ready to get funded and financed. Taking an example on the solar thermal part, well, very important to mention is that the platform is semi-automatic. So uh, most of the work done is completely automatically. Nobody has to take care about us. it. And by this, we decrease and reduce significantly the transaction costs. Taking the example solar thermal, um, what the platform does? Well, in the very beginning, we take the data that the applicant provides to us and uh, meaning the design data and also the expected yield out of this uh, technology and we completely start automatically in the background simulation models. And the trustee platform is going to compare this provided and expected data from the applicant to what we based on our scientific and applied research experience based uh, simulation would um, expect from this project. And if we compare these simulation expected data, we are in the situation to 
uh, give the feedback to the applicant, well, this is maybe not such a good project. So this meaning you get a negative evaluation, you are get a rejection of the platform. This is the one thing, but if you have done your work well, yeah, well, then you get a positive assessment uh, from the platform, meaning at the same time that you are ready to get a bankable project, you get a report, and with this report, a financing commitment of trustee. And this is now linking the project assessment to the financing vehicle, the securitization vehicle. So what does such a financing commitment mean? Well, um, in this moment, trustee, um, is, this is the first moment where somebody from, from the platform, from trustee is really getting in contact with the applicant. So what we're doing is we check the conformity of the customer contract terms and the payment plan. So we're just checking, okay, are all contracts already on, on board? Uh, we compare this and we also provide you some standardized uh, contract templates. Also, one we want to achieve a reduction of these transaction costs. Also, we are taking care about some credit insurances in these moments. And if everything is fulfilled, we say, okay, in the moment when you are going to implement this uh, project successfully, this will be the moment where you will get your money back. Now you will ask, okay, who will get which money back? What does this mean? We're saying, um, we are looking at this contract, what I already said. So the customer has to confirm that, for example, a solar thermal plant has been successfully installed there and it's really operating as it was expected. The second thing is that in this moment, the technology supplier more or less sells his claims against the end user to trustee. And this means that in this moment, the supplier has all the money back on his uh, bank account. And uh, from this moment on, the end user is going to pay for the energy or this installation to trustee and not to the uh, energy supplier anymore. This is a securitization vehicle, a forfeiting financing uh, facility that we have developed and set up. So what does this really mean? Um, well, we have these three stakeholders on board. Um, the investor in the best case will earn some money. Um, this is achieved by on one end the service provider or the, or the supplier receives the sum of these contracting receivable, receivables in the moment of a successful implementation. Yeah? So everything, the money is already back on the back, bank account and this is going to improve significantly the credit credit worthiness of the supplier. What is an advantage compared to a typical ESCO setup? The industrial customer, the end user as we call it, well, they pay uh, from this moment on the successful implementation according to the payment plan to trustee. This is uh, a fixed payment plan, so not a performance contracting. We have heard from the suppliers and the end users that this is something they are really looking for because by this we get rid of this baseline scenario of problems and challenges that we have. So we decouple it and this makes it easier also for the end users to have a thorough planning here. The technical risks are still on the side of the supplier. So with all these O and E, M and guarantee obligations, is the supplier is still on board and has to ensure that the technology itself is working as it was expected. I already mentioned in the beginning that actually we are focusing on excess heat or waste heat recovery. We are focusing on biogas and biomass and solar thermal, so especially addressing industrial heating and cooling demand. But with the end of the funded projects, we are now commercializing it and we are already working on an extension of the addressed projects. So we are talking about control systems. We are talking about, for example, photovoltaics and heat pumps that are more or less ready to be implemented. And we're also uh, developing new financial tools that make this economic assessment much easier for us as the trustee platform, but also for the applicants who are going to submit their proposals. Outlook and summary. Well, the Horizon 2020 project, this funded project, gave us the great possibility to develop what we have, have achieved by now. So the set up of the securitization vehicle as a really innovative financing scheme um, is um, yeah, unique worldwide uh, to the moment. Uh, we have developed it. The project assessment platform was developed and is now commercially available. Um, and what is very important, we have significantly minimized the risk for 
the end user who gets a ready to be implemented technology, they get the energy out of it. We have minimized the risk for investors uh, from the technical point of view, so they don't have to care about the technical risk and the assessment anymore in the future. And we have reduced the risk also for the supplier compared to an energy performance contracting or ESCO model. Um, they get the money, money back and this is in the moment of a successful installation and this is something we can offer to the suppliers here. The next step, well, um, we have quite a good project uh, pipeline in the meanwhile, we are focusing on Austria, Germany, uh, Sweden actually, and now are looking to extend our project pipeline also for other uh, countries. But nevertheless, we are looking for projects uh, who want to test, who want to go for the platform and see what the platform can offer to them. Still, we are focusing on industrial process heating and cooling on well-developed projects. So we, are, we do not see ourselves in the moment as a kind of matchmaking a project development platform. Maybe this is an option for the future, but not for the moment. We are looking for the ready to be implemented projects. Investor acquisition, we have um, yeah, two investors on board, but still I think this approach of trustees is really, really interesting also for others. And I already mentioned that we need reliable uh, technology suppliers with a huge experience and um, reference projects in this field. So also here I want to invite suppliers to go for trustee to have a look, to get in touch with us and see which um, yeah, advantages we can offer to you. Also talking about fast lane assessments um, to be done via the platform. And as I already mentioned, we are going to extend the platform also to other technologies, uh, having in mind that we will not solve all solutions of uh, all challenges of the decarbonization by solar thermal, biomass, biogas and waste recovery. We have to open up our mind and offer a lot more to the industry and the technology suppliers. With this, I end my presentation and hand over back um, to, the, to the chair. Yeah, thank you, Jürgen. Um, then let's move on with the next presentation. Um, industrial production to 2050. The PIPIT um, or PEPIT zero model. Um, Sereso will show us an industrial production model that is designed to assist the climate finance frontrunners in the transition risk assessments of their portfolios. With the help of this model, um, the perspectives of industrial production and final demand for materials is visible for decarbonization. Um, the presenter, um, Sylvain Sourisou, is an economist at the Industry Department of the French Environmental and Energy Management Agency, ADEM. He's especially involved in the Life Finance Climate Project, and he holds a PhD at the University of Paris, Saclay, and uh, ADEM. So the floor is yours. Okay. Um... Thank you very much, uh, Diana, for, uh, for the introduction. And uh, thank you for those who uh, attend this, uh, this session and this presentation, which is about um, a model called the Pepito that has been created to uh, estimate industrial production to uh, 2050. This uh, results from um, a collaboration between uh, Negawatt, which is a, a non-governmental French uh, think tank, and uh, ADEM, uh, the French Agency for Ecological uh, Transition. Um, yes, I can't uh, have the control. Oh, okay. Great, so first let me introduce a uh, um, uh, few elements of context with the industry sector in France. Uh, it's around 20% of the total energy uh, consumed, and it represents uh, as well around 20% of the overall GHG emissions in France. There are more than 250 sectors of activity and more than uh, 40,000 industrial units. But uh, what is more important is the, the place for, uh, for the heavy industry in the, in this, uh, in the whole industry. And as you can see on the, on the figure uh, in blue, you have uh, plants with more than 20 employees and uh, you have in uh, yellow and green respectively, electro-intensive and gas-intensive uh, plants. 
In brown, in, in brown you have um, the plans that are included in the EU ETS. So um, here, the, uh, what we should keep in mind is that a very small number of plants is responsible for uh, more than 70% of energy consumption, as well as more than 70% of uh, GHG emissions. So the limit of the, this limit of the number of companies here facilitates uh, to uh, address the decarbonation issue for the whole industry. Uh, now let's focus on um, two other elements of, uh, of context. Uh, in terms uh, of uh, perspective. So we have uh, 2050 is the, is the horizon set up in the uh, French uh, low carbon strategy. And for industry, uh, there is a, a target that has been established. This target is of uh, minus 81% of GHG, uh, GHG compared to uh, 2015 level. Um, there is also an intermediate target in 2035 of minus 30% of GHG compared to uh, 2015 level. But behind this, uh, this strategy, there is a, a macroeconomic framework uh, which established um, a rise of the GDP and also uh, a quasi constant level of, uh, of production. So uh, this assumption means that uh, all efforts to decarbonize industry rely on technology and, um, and green technologies, actually. So 2050 is also uh, the horizon set up in, um, in a study uh, uh, for a prospective study at ADEM, which aims at uh, determining the energy demand and energy mix uh, for um, um, consuming sectors, which are uh, transport, agriculture, uh, buildings and industry. But uh, if we focus on industry, actually we have uh, a lot of literature uh, talking about specific consumptions, but uh, the, um, it's, it's specific consumption is pretty well documented, but production level um, as a production level actually it's not, especially at this, uh, at this time horizon. So um, here comes a, a real need for uh, a tool that can modelize those uh, level of, uh, of production uh, to 2050. And this is the, the main goal of, uh, of our model called the Pepito. Uh, the main goal is, uh, is basically the, the, is to, to modelize industrial production according to final demand uh, for materials. Uh, but beyond this, uh, this purpose, we also want to uh, open debates uh, regarding industrial production levels to, uh, to consider in prospective scenarios. But not only uh, scenarios regarding the, uh, the uh, ecological transition, but in a more general aspect, actually. Uh, the, the second uh, uh, goal is, is also, I mean, beyond this, we also want to uh, initiate discussion with a company uh, about the output issue, since, as you can guess, it, uh, it can be quite sensitive to speak about a decrease of the output in, uh, in the future. But still, we want to open the debate and discuss with industrials, as well as uh, with uh, public uh, authorities, authorities, since it can be uh, of interest for both of them. Well, now let's uh, focus on the, on the methodology. And uh, the model uh, includes uh, nine sectors, actually, and uh, nine materials, since they are the, the most, uh, well, these, those industries are the most energy intensive industry. And we have uh, in metals, we have steel and aluminum, um, as well as uh, clinker and glass, and representing the, uh, the, industry, the chemical industry, we have uh, ammoniac ethylene, chlorine, and we also have paper and sugar. So all of them represent around 60% uh, of the total energy consumed in the, in the industry. Now, uh, the first step of the project consisted in, um, in mapping uh, the flows of material according to demand from uh, various sectors and the uh, reference year. So as you can see, the reference year here is 2014. 
just because uh, this is the, the, the year where we have uh, most of data available. And if we look at the, on each graph, you have on the left the supply and on the, the right the demand for each materials. And as you can see, the situation uh, is quite different according to materials. For instance, regarding clinker, we can see that uh, demand only comes from uh, buildings and infrastructure, uh, while regarding ethylene, the, the demand come, uh, comes from uh, various, uh, various sectors of demand. So now that we have this, uh, this situation in 2014, uh, the question is about the prospective to 2050. And here, uh, several steps are, are required to, uh, to modelize the, the, prospect, the, the production. Uh, we start first from estimating the, the final demand uh, in goods and equipment. So it's uh, represented by uh, the blue cells actually on the, on the left. And then, uh, of course, we apply also an import-export ratio. So uh, we have, uh, it, it gives actually a need for materials that can be either fulfilled by a transferred material or basic materials. Uh, for instance, let's take a building. Uh, the building in the building, we have uh, steel, which is a basic material, and, clunky, uh, and the concrete, which is a transferred material that comes from cement and then clunky. So uh, here, uh, we can, uh, from this, we can estimate the uh, consumption, the need for basic materials. And then uh, if we apply um, another uh, ratio, uh, import-export ratio, sorry, and the, uh, the intensity of recycling, then we can have um, a perspective of the industrial production to 2050. Uh, but the main question that uh, behind the perspective is uh, actually how final demand for good and equipment can evolve. So that is why we have, uh, we have collected more than 200 parameters that are uh, classified according to various, um, uh, various uh, topics. For instance, uh, the number of houses, uh, the number of houses built is, um, is a parameter of sobriety since it can decrease the, uh, the, the demand for, for cement and then for clinker. As well, uh, the market share of food in uh, the building materials is a parameter of substitution since it can replace concrete and then clinker. So we have more than 200 parameters in, uh, in the model. But now um, let's take uh, an application and how the, let's see how the, the, the model works actually. Well, it starts, to, um, it starts with, a, with a final use, which is here represented by a building. And then uh, a concrete content is, um, is, uh, is associated to the building, but more generally, a concrete content is associated to, is associated to every final use. Um, after that, we have a set of parameters. For instance, uh, we, uh, we want to see um, how, uh, how the, the, the number of house will, uh, how the number of buildings will, will evolve in, until 2050. So it will be computed uh, in terms of uh, square meters. But if we take the uh, final use, which uh, for instance, roads and, and bridge, it can also be expressed in terms of kilometers, but uh, yes, in terms of uh, kilometers. We also have uh, assumptions uh, about market shares of substitutes. As I said uh, just previously, we have uh, the, the wood, uh, the market share of wood, uh, for instance, which is a substitute to, uh, to concrete. And this, then this gives uh, an evolution of the demand of concrete to 2050. So as I said earlier, concrete is the transformed material, and then we want to go to the basic materials. So. Um, we have a demand of concrete to 2050. And after setting up a ratio of cement in concrete and then of uh, clanker content in cement, then we can formulate scenarios of uh, production of clanker to 2050. Okay, so the, the main thing here that, um, um, that we have to keep in mind is that such scenarios uh, rely really, really strongly um, on the assumptions you made, uh, you, you, you make uh, on the final use. 
So here, the, the, the scenarios of Grand Care rely very much on the number of, of buildings in 2050. Then let's, uh, let's focus on a uh, few applications. I mean, the, the output of the model, uh, the output can be expressed in many ways. Uh, so here you, uh, you have two, two graphs. On the left, uh, we look at on the left, this is the demand, uh, which comes uh, essentially from, uh, from the buildings and the infrastructure sector in green. And uh, as you can see, the, the, on the top left, um, you have in uh, the situation in 2014, the demand in 2014, and then the uh, two other uh, green bars are the two scenarios modelized in uh, modelized. And we have uh, the second bar is a, is a business as usual, where no significant change have been uh, considered. While the third uh, green bar is, uh, is another scenario, which is an ecological transition, for instance. And here we have assumed that there is a 30% uh, a decrease of 30% of new buildings in 2050 compared to the, the level in, in 2014. And then uh, on the right, uh, it's the, the projection of the demand to the supply. Of course, we still have the, uh, the, the bar uh, in 2014 uh, with 13 mi uh, million tons. And then we can see um, the, uh, the situation uh, with uh, two scenarios. Well, as you can see, the, the business as usual uh, lead to, um, to an increase of the, of the clunker production. Why, if we apply a decrease of 30% of new buildings, then we have uh, a decrease of 50% of the clunker production uh, compared to the, the level in 2014. The, the red cycle here represents uh, assumptions in the, in the low carbon strategy uh, of uh, France that I, uh, which I spoke about uh, earlier. So it shows the importance of taking the, this level of, of production in the, in the model. And then uh, to finish, I have another example of ammoniac. Uh, well, as you can see on the, on the graph on the left, uh, ammoniac is mainly used uh, in, the, uh, in the chemical sector as, a, as a, an input in the nitrogen fertilizers. So we have still uh, our uh, business as usual scenarios, but if we apply a, a decrease of 50% of the, of the demand of the consumption of nitrogen fertilizers, we can see the, the strong decrease of the demand in ammoniac. And then on the, on the right, you have the projection to the supply. And what we can see, uh, oh, sorry, in gray, it's the import export uh, parameter. So we can first, we can see that uh, France uh, strongly relies on, on imports of, uh, of ammoniac. Uh, but what I, well, yeah, what I wanted to say is the, uh, the, the third bar um, uh, with the TE scenario. So we can see the, the strong uh, decrease of, uh, of production of ammoniac by a factor of 40% compared to 2014. And if we apply another import-export ratio, it, this is the last uh, blue and gray bar, then we can see uh, that uh, even uh, um, a strong uh, decrease of the demand of ammoniac, uh, we can have a, a rise of the, of the, of the supply uh, of the production of ammoniac since there is a, a strategy, an industrial strategy uh, here that has been taken by the, by the government. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, um, Sylvain. Um, you made great in time, <laughs> exactly 15 minutes, <laughs> thanks. Um, yes, and if you have any questions, um, please feel free to use the Q&A section on the right side of Uber. And now we come to the next two presentations um, where we look at industrial parks. Um, Niels and Lind will present to us um, an answer for the following question. So how can cooperation between existing electricity intensive industry look like? What huge synergy is possible if aiming at energy synthesis with existing materials and energy systems and future establishments? The title is, <clears throat> how can we best create a synergy between existing electricity intensive industry, existing materials and energy systems and future establishments? Um, he is business 
um, development director at Boden Business Agency, um, which focuses on um, promoting and developing Boden as an attractive destination for energy intensive establishments. Um, Niels Lind is main, his main focus now is to meet data center sustainability and energy efficiency demand against local benefits and assets and thereby creating new circular economies. Niels Lind, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Diana, for that introduction. I hope everybody can hear me clearly here. Um, uh, and hopefully also see my slides. So first of all, thank you ECEEE and the Swedish Energy Agency for inviting me to this webinar. I think this is an important topic, not only for us locally to discuss, but also on a national and global level. So I'm very happy to share how we can contribute to become more resource efficient and help decarbonize the industries. I am here to present and introduce the Energy Symbiosis in Boden, which is a cooperation between our municipality and the Swedish Energy Agency. So Nils Lind is my name and I work as business developer for the municipality owned organization called Boden Business Agency and one of our main tasks is to develop large ready to build and zoned sites for energy intensive industries which include all the necessary infrastructure. And the input for our site development are driven by the requirements of the locally committed UN SDG goals, as well as the requirements from various energy intensive industries. Now, let me see if I can click, oops. I went a bit too far here, sorry about this. So, so just to get your bearings where I'm calling from, I'm in a town in northern Sweden called Boden. It's uh, located in the Arctic region just by the Arctic Circle and it has about 30,000 inhabitants. Uh, I'd, I'd like to mention a few intensive in, uh, energy intensive industries uh, and new investments uh, in this region. Uh, we, it's LKAB and Boleden who operate large mines here and we have uh, the Swedish steel manufacturer and their hybrid development project which are working on to decarbonize the steel manufacturing and then Facebook's uh, hyperscale data centers are in the area and also Northvolt's a massive green battery production facility. Um, so this is where we are. Uh, so hopefully, now you see a map of northern Sweden. Uh, this is the uh, source of hydro generated power at low cost. And the idea is to use most of it in the region rather than transmitting it away. In essence, using the power locally gives us an opportunity to create jobs that don't exist today and making it even more attractive region to live in. Uh, also important to point out on this on this map is the 100 years of power infrastructure development to support the critical infrastructure operations such as mining and data centers and so on. Uh, uh, so so the um, the resilience for this type of operation has during these years been developed and built into the grid infrastructure. And thanks to this, energy intensive establishments in this region are undergoing strong development and has put Boden and the region on the map in the eyes of international stakeholders. Um, let me see. Yeah. So for, for us at Boden Business Agency, being able to develop these ready to build sites with renewable power sources for, for the energy intensive industries is not enough to, to decarbonize the industries. Uh, the municipality is committed to Agenda 2030 and is looking for ways to be more resource efficient in the energy sector. Therefore, we are very happy to have signed an agreement with 
I think it was in June, with the Swedish Energy Agency to become a strategic partner or a strategic node for resource efficient circular energy system between the IT sector and the food cluster. And the purpose with this engagement is to create synergies between existing energy intensive industries, material flows and energy systems, and to develop the conditions for further establishment of different types of demo and pilot plants. We call it energy driven business development. Uh, and hopefully the innovations we develop here can be re replicable uh, uh, for other locations with similar infrastructure and similar businesses. So this is, this is um, what it looks like, uh, the demo and pilot area uh, that, that we have defined together with the Swedish Energy, uh, Swedish Energy Agency. Uh, it's a 70 hectares large area as seen on this photo. You can see uh, different or various energy sources such as the electricity uh, uh, from the hydropower plant. We have the biogas plant, uh, a combined heat and power plant, uh, as well as all the large energy consumers such as data centers, and the food producers in this area. So the, the existing ecosystem is a perfect testing ground to pilot new business models between these uh, industries. Uh, in, the, in the context of the energy symbiosis, we identified pr projects that would fit into this area. Uh, that uh, connect is existing industries together and create new energy and material flows, and hence also new business models. So far, we have identified more than 20 projects that could fit into this energy system. Maybe 23 now with the trustee uh, project uh, to, to uh, monetize the, mater the material and energy flows. But we'll talk about that later. <laughs> So, so just to, just to uh, give you an example of ongoing projects that we have started is one example is to connect a data center or a small data center with a greenhouse, um, uh, which looks like this, yeah. So, so here the purpose is that electricity flowing through the data center or through the service generates a lot of waste heat that will be used for food production. Uh, the, and, and also, moreover, the, the, food the food waste will be used for the biogas production. And the biogas can be used to produce hydrogen, uh, which, uh, which is used for transporting the foods to the market. Uh, and moreover, the biogas plant, we can apply uh, carbon capture, which the greenhouses need. And the greenhouses produces oxygen or excess of oxygen, which uh, the fish farms uh, need and so forth. So there's a circular thinking in all our ongoing projects. Uh, so this, this one will start in October. Uh, if everything goes to plan. But one that is live is, uh, is this project. Um, this is connecting a, a high performance data center with a biomass drying facility. Uh, we're reusing the heat waste to dry wood chips in this case. Uh, this went uh, live uh, two days ago, I think. So it's going to be interesting to see the, the outcome of this project. But of course, uh, I mean, making these projects a reality is not as easy as it, it, it seems. Uh, there are always challenges to everything uh, that we need to address. And one, one main challenge we already have experienced is to get industry segments that naturally don't have a relationship to cooperate with each other. Uh, new, new, the new business models create new areas of responsibility and ownership. I mean, who, who owns the interface between the, the two businesses or the two industries? 
to address this challenge, there is a need uh, to have a neutral non-profit organization managing the expectations between the stakeholders. But also this organization is the entity to seek uh, private and public funding for the project and to allocate it to the, the various projects that we've identified before. Uh, another main challenge, uh, and I don't think that's specific for our region, is that projects were new, when these new connections between businesses are created, require hard investments. And finding uh, public funding for these type of hard investments is, is, is difficult to achieve. There's a lot of money out there for research and development, but actual hard investments, it, it's hard to find. So public funding systems are crucial and we need, uh, and uh, there is a need to, to, to meet these, uh, this challenge. Uh, we would like to see a lot more support on that side. Uh, to to uh, to face the this challenge uh, of finding public uh, uh, funding. So, uh, I mean, we are open to welcome corporations who are willing to take part in this energy symbiosis. And uh, uh, if you if you'd like to, you can you can contact us on the uh, on this on the people on this slide, the Swedish Energy Agency, uh, Borden Business Agency, and Borden Business Park uh, uh, to discuss it further. Thank you for my time, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Yes, thank you. Um, Niels, uh, really interesting, I think, uh, to hear that you um, are thinking about trust DE to cooperate, etc. So I'm really looking forward uh, to what we will hear maybe later in the discussion. But now let's come to the last presentation um, of this session. Uh, it's also about industrial parks and will be presented by Gokan Kirkel who will focus on purchasing and power as results of analysis of energy services in the four biggest industrial parks in Turkey. Um, the title is A New Model for Jointly Purchased Energy Services in Turkish Industrial Parks. Um, Gohan Kirke works at the Center for Energy and Sustainable Development, Department of Industrial Engineering, um, Kadi has University, I hope I pronounced this correctly, <laughs> in Istanbul, um, Turkey. Yes. Thank you, Diana, uh, for the introduction. Uh, actually, the uh, the presentation uh, is part of the the work that we uh, performed uh, over the last two years as a part of uh, Horizon 2020 projects called S Parks. Uh, we are actually looking at uh, more business models for. Uh, joint energy services uh, at industrial parks. Uh, this case is related to Turkish industrial parks. Uh, okay, I can't, okay, now I can go to the next slide. Okay, uh, organized industrial zones are uh, pretty popular in Turkey. Uh, and there are actually around 234 actively operating industrial parks and uh, uh, we believe that this is one of the best industrial park models in the world uh, just because of uh, the funding, initial funding of establishment of the industrial park comes from the government. But later the, the park management or the government of the industrial park is uh, performed by both public and private uh, sectors. So it's, it's, uh, once the initial funding is provided by the government, uh, the, uh, the later the park is government, uh, governed by as a public-private partnership. And another good thing uh, about uh, industrial parks uh, in Turkey is uh, they have joint purchase uh, services, especially energy services. Uh, this includes power and natural gas and also the water. So uh, they think that if they can manage this uh, joint purchasing so they can save a lot. 
And uh, actually, uh, we have uh, some laws uh, stating that uh, organized industry parts can act as a distribution company. So this is a great advantage. They can purchase, uh, you know, power and natural gas uh, from uh, from different uh, sources and then sell it to uh, industrial park companies. And uh, in this uh, presentation, I will focus on the, the electricity part. And just because uh, things started to change in the in the in the market, uh, electricity market in Turkey. And I will uh, state a problem and then try to uh, propose a solution. And just to remind you that uh, our, the cumulative electricity consumption in most of the parks in Turkey is quite high. Actually, uh, most of them are greater than 50 million kilowatt hours. And this uh, actually sometimes uh, gives some challenges because you need to. Um, uh, supply on this, uh, you know, continuous uh, energy service to your companies, uh, and uh, this, uh, this is a big challenge. And coming back to Spark's project, or as to to run the project, it's uh, uh, the name is new energy service models in industrial parks. We have several industrial parks uh, partners in Italy, Austria, Spain, and Portugal. And we also have some university partners. And we call the, the big uh, light, uh, the industrial parks in these four countries is the lighthouse parks because we say that, okay, the, they have the best practices and we try to learn from them. And the, the parks that try to learn from lighthouse parks are called the follower parks. And most of the follower parks in Turkey, and we try to uh, learn from the follower parks, try to learn uh, from the good energy efficiency practices of lighthouse parks. The project uh, aims to reduce the energy costs and consumption in the industrial parks, also aim at increasing the production of renewable energy in industrial parks. I'm going to the next slide. So what, uh, uh, what's the current situation in the joint to purchase electric services in industrial spark in Turkey? Uh, in terms of electricity and natural gas services, as I said before, industrial park management, uh, or we can call it a management company, uh, can act as a distribution company. This is a great advantage because in the past, industrial park management company can purchase, uh, could purchase electricity through bilateral agreements and they can sell uh, them to companies after adding some transaction costs. So bilateral agreements worked very well uh, until, uh, until 2018. I will discuss what happened after 2018. Uh, at some point, uh, you know, most of the biggest uh, industrial companies, they use this model uh, using bilateral agreements to purchase electricity. But after uh, 2018, we started to uh, activate this uh, daily electricity market in Turkey. And uh, once we established that, so government wants uh, big industrial uh, companies uh, and, and others, they want more players in the, in the market. So they also uh, established these retail companies and um, industrial parks started to purchase electricity from retail companies. And then we started to discuss the tariffs, uh, the tariff uh, that they use for the big industrial parks, depending on the prices on the daily electricity markets. In addition, government uh, started to uh, collect uh, feed-in tariff payments from the big industrial comp uh, comp customers and things started to uh, become complicated. So, as we will see in the next slides, uh, the tariff, the supply tariff, final resource supply tariff started to increase uh, starting from 2016 because uh, the prices are determined in the market. And additionally, we have the uh, feed in tariff uh, payments and uh, the price determining factors started to become the electricity market clearing price, 
plus the shade cost feed-in tariff supported by the electricity generation from the renewable energy sources in Turkey. So mainly the the energy ministry want wanted to uh, to collect uh, feed-in tariff uh, payments from the big industrial uh, companies, including organized industrial zones. So as you can see, the the final resource tariff supply for uh, organized industrial zones started to increase, uh, and they are now uh, higher than the retail electricity price. So the question uh, the companies in the industrial parks, uh, they started to ask that, what is the point? I mean, being in the industrial parks, because we started to pay uh, higher for the, the, for the power. So uh, for, uh, from, uh, the perspective of the companies, they, they were right. And if you look at from the uh, perspective of government, uh, they also looking at uh, a place to collect this feed-in tariff mechanism. So uh, now uh, we say that uh, the, the companies now, uh, or the organized uh, industrial zones in Turkey, now started to think about uh, more innovative ways of, uh, you know, purchasing electricity. We call this the new business model uh, for joint uh, power purchases. And we offer them two solutions. Uh, the first one is uh, they have uh, enough, enough uh, area, uh, both the rooftop and uh, the other areas in the industrial zones. You, they can start uh, produce licensed and unlicensed electricity uh, from renewable energy sources. So, uh, so instead of purchasing electricity from the retail company, so you can just produce your own electricity uh, by using your rooftops and other uh, like wind energy and uh, biomass, etc. And this is also uh, good because we have the feed-in tariff mechanism, and you can also sell this electricity easily to to the grid without any problem. The second uh, solution that uh, we offer to organize industrial zones, instead of uh, you know, purchasing uh, uh, power from the retail companies, you, you can actually become the, the player in the market. Uh, just uh, establish your own uh, whole tra wholesale trading company and just become the, the player in the daily electricity markets. Uh, you can reduce your electricity costs. So for this one, you need to establish a small company in the industrial zone. You need to you know, hire people just uh, doing like daily electricity trading in the market. Uh, this is another, another option. Also, we uh, found another way uh, for the big players in the industrial zones. For example, if you're uh, so, you know, in the industrial parks, there are some big companies, small companies, and for big companies, uh, it could be that they can come together and make an agreement with an aggregator, and that aggregator can search for a cheaper electricity in the market on their behalf. So, uh, instead of organized industrial zones or industri individual companies establish a uh, whole trade trading company, uh, we can, uh, they can do, uh, the, they can go to, uh, they can follow this option. So this might seem a uh, more efficient approach. So these are the uh, three solutions that we offer to uh, industrial parks in Turkey for joint power purchases. Thank you very much for uh, listening. Uh, I can answer some questions later. Thank you. Yes, thank you, um, Gokhan, for the presentation. Uh, now we have time for um, questions and discussions. So maybe we start with um, Jürgen. Um, you mentioned um, that there are technology energy providers, um, but there are also intermediaries, intermediaries like ESCOs. And um, how is it? Do you consider them also as uh, providers? Yes and no. Um, I mean, this depends if an ESCO needs money, then yes. Yeah. But uh, our experience is that 
a lot of ESCOs, ESCOs some already have some money in the background, so they are not looking really for the money. Um, the, the, the business model of trustee is, is twofold. On the one hand, it's the project assessment. So if, for example, in the future, an ESCO needs some technical expertise to check if what is going to be implemented is well done or not, then this is something trustee can offer. But still the core of our business model is, is the, the financing, the securitization vehicle. So this is definitely something we prefer to go for. And again, if an ESCO is, let's say, the project developer um, bringing the end user and the technology supplier together, and is then willing to hand over the financing to somebody else, then trustee is one solution. OK, great. Thank you. And um, another question here is, um, you're now commercial after Horizon 2020. And uh, you also said you will go Europe wide. And you also mentioned uh, new technologies. Um, so which other technologies will, would you like to cover? Well, um, the trustee funded project was focusing on industrial heating and cooling. Um, but we have now already models ready to be implemented on heat pumps, um, also for photovoltaic. This is ready and this is going to go live, I would say, in the next one, one month about. Um, and regarding the, the countries, um, the reason why we are actually focusing on, on Austria, Germany and, and Sweden is that here we have some guarantees in, in the background. So our financial partner, Renax, so maybe some of you have listened to his presentation yesterday, Winfried Baumann. Um, he is now has, has to set up the whole financial construct behind it. And here we are needing, we are looking for some guarantees also in the background. And this is quite well solved actually in Austria, Germany, and also Sweden. But uh, we are happy within the next months, hopefully, to open it up to Spain, what was a core partner in the trustee project, and also Portugal. And we have already presented the trustee approach also within a UNIDA project already in, in Malaysia. So also the Malaysian bank is really interested in it. And um, we do think that we have to focus on some countries become, because we cannot do everything in one moment. You have to focus on your core uh, expertise, but uh, we see no barrier to extend trustee to other countries too. Oh, wow. So you will even go beyond Europe uh, sure. and the whole world. Money is needed. Um, Niels just mentioned uh, that trustee would be interesting. Um, did you have a discussion already? No, not or yet, but I, I think this, the Niels, we have to discuss this uh, after the session. Um, we have a Swedish partner. We have Niels Borg & Co. So ECEEE was partnering in, in the trustee project. And anyhow, Niels will definitely, and Jason will be a good, good um, contact point for you. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing this discussion in the, in the near future. Uh, likewise, we, I mean, we, we've been looking at uh, blockchain technology to monetize various different uh, energy flows, but maybe you already have, have uh, something that is worth testing for, for this. Yeah, de definitely. Blockchain, I think, is the next step. Yeah? Blockchain is, is going to help us in, in, in the field of standardized contracts to be set up. And originally, Trustee also had in mind that we are going to I mentioned that now we have fixed payment plans, but in the very beginning of trustee, we had the idea to do this uh, billing also based on an energy performance contract. This has changed in, uh, during the project that we did there because we, we got the feedback from the end users that they're not looking for these flexible payment plans. But we do think that now we have to do the next step and include also blockchain. And um, yeah, so we have already some partners on board discussing with the German partner and also with the Romanian partner how to do it. And um, maybe this is something, uh, anyhow, we sure. have to think sure. about. Sure, let's, let's talk uh, later. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, great. Um, now I have also um, questions for um, Sylvain. Um, many of these companies you are targeting are multinationals. And how is P2 um, transferable to other countries for them to follow the same approach? Is that possible? Yes, uh, it, it, it's it clearly uh, it's clearly uh, one of the on, of the limit of the model, uh, since we only have this import export ratio, and uh, like for Clunky, it's not 
it's not uh, really an issue because Clankern does not travel a lot uh, abroad. But for steel, for instance, it's an issue because we can produce steel in France, but it's sold uh, within EU. So that's why um, first we try to adapt our results to this uh, to these facts because we cannot uh, just uh, pretend it's uh, it's produced in France while it's it's going to be sold abroad. But uh, as I said in the comment in the chat, uh, we have we are going to uh, to develop a second version of the model in which we we will uh, add this. Uh, I mean, we extend the international trade uh, uh, aspects. Uh, and then we are going to uh, to uh, to solve. I mean, try to solve the issue. Uh, like we also want to um, to extend uh, the uh, the basic materials we have in the model, and uh, we also are going to add a, a unit dealing with the uh, circular uh, uh, circular economy. Like it's going to to um, to take into consideration a stock of waste for each final goods. And then we will have this uh, this loop uh, that can uh, that of course to be more accurate in our uh, in our results. But yeah, it's 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 still under uh, under progress for uh, for the new the new version actually. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question is: um, you mentioned the import export ratio, but you also mentioned the recycle I don't know factor or ratio or whatever. So um, do you have a change during the time? Um, so you may be um, improved recycling factor, or is it just the same? Yeah, I mean recycling is just is only um, is only taken into consideration as a ratio, as you said. Uh, it's like the uh, secondary material, uh, the the share of the secondary material in the in the, the raw material. So recycling is only uh, taken into consideration like this. And we can uh, make it. Uh, we can make it uh, bigger in the in the years coming. So we can, uh, I don't know, uh, go from 10% uh, of secondary materials in the product. And in 2030, for instance, we can uh, assume that it's going to be 30%. Okay, that's that's the thing we can do. But uh, it's still uh, there's still something to be to be done in this uh, circular economy aspect because we don't have stock of waste. We don't have other aspects that should be really relevant in uh, in this model. Okay, thank you a lot. Um, and now some questions uh, for Neil. Um, who or what uh, was the driver for the sustainable innovative approach for Boden and for the region? Um, so was it the municipal government you mentioned or other universities or NGOs? And um, how did you get such a leadership for a way forward? Um, well, I mean, first of all, uh, the, the municipality has committed to the national government uh, commitments uh, of uh, becoming 50% more energy efficient by 2030. I think it's part of the agenda 2030 uh, commitment. Uh, but, but also there, there is, uh, we've been criticized by the European Union to not being very self-sufficient when it comes to food production. Uh, we import 80% uh, of everything we eat and, and produce 20%. So, so, and especially now in these Corona times, it's, it's more, uh, it's more, uh, it's very, uh, it highlights the, the issue even more. So, so, so the, 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 there are nas national uh, guidances that we we are looking to, but th but we've also noticed locally that um, let's say the data centers that we have attracted here, they just uh, let out the waste heat into the air, and, th and that's not really the way we want to go. We want to be able to reuse that in a in a in a very good manner. Uh, so we we um, had a, had a, a, a meeting um, with the Swedish Energy Agency where they said that uh, our thoughts and their thoughts uh, matched perfectly. So 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 that's that's how this energy symbiosis was formed. Uh, 
but of course, nothing will have happen if we don't uh, uh, get uh, public and private funding for for these uh, for these things. Uh, we've had some experience, uh, which is our kind of our role model when it comes to uh, EU funding. Let's say uh, we've had we have a, a few Horizon 2020 projects that we've worked on. One is called Bowden Type Data Center Project, which is a, a fully funded uh, Horizon 2020 project, uh, and and we we would. In the projects within the energy symbiosis, we hope to kind of copy that model into the into the um, uh, into the, those projects as well, and of course with the help of uh, um, the Swedish Energy Agency, uh, and and also we're looking into something called the European In Innovation Fund, which uh, kind of uh, fits perfectly in what we're trying to do. But again, uh, a lot is around hard investments, uh, and not so much about uh, uh, not about so much about research and development. It's more hard investments because one industry segment doesn't want to pay for something they're not going to own or be responsible for, and uh, and it's the same with the receiving end. Uh, uh, they also don't want to. <laughs> so we need something in the, uh, something to to integrate to the interface between these two segments, uh, and we need help uh, funding these uh, to to find these new business models. Uh, yeah, was that an answer to your question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hope so. Um, the, the person who has asked that question, um, but if you are speaking of um, public funding, um, do you mean that you need also more coming from the EU regional funds, or is it more the uh, yeah Swedish? Uh, well, I mean, it depends of the size of the project. What we're trying to do, I mean, some some projects which uh, which I showed you in the presentation. Uh, may not need uh, um, uh, European uh, funding, but, but there are other projects that we have identified which would suit in the energy symbiosis, which would need uh, quite a lot of um, public money from, from, let's say, the European Union. So yes, we need both. <laughs> Okay, maybe a question from me. Um, the two projects um, you um, presented today um, is, are, are all using the data center waste heat um, for food production. But you also said there are more projects um, in the pipe or in uh, preparation. Um, are those all very similar to data center plus food production or are they completely different? Um, the the, the um, agreement we have with the um, uh, Swedish Energy Agency is within the sectors of IT and, and food production. So, so there, is a fo there is a focus on, on the data centers, but it's, it's not exclusive uh, data center uh, Energy. Uh, uh, we have uh, we have a project we, which uh, which uh, is a, a large battery that would let's say regulate the river flow, uh, making it more like a natural unregulated river. So so the flow is even, which which uh, is is good for the environment, but but also it's good for the for the um, the generators, not the generator, the turbines in, in the hydropower plants, for instance, they, the maintenance uh, is, more, is more even and, uh, and predictable. So there are benefits uh, in other projects which are not connected to the data center or the IT sector. Okay, thank you. Um, then I have a question for um, Gokan. Um, the question is, uh, five or seven years ago, there was a UNIDO project um, providing measurement equipment, etc., to allow the selectors um, OIZs 
to promote good energy management practices. And the question is, has that expanded or just failed? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So uh, there uh, have been many uh, projects related to energy efficiency in industrial parks in the past. Uh, some of them were funded uh, from inter international funds, some of them were funded from local funds. Uh, the problem is actually, we also studied uh, some barriers uh, towards energy efficiency in, in industrial parks. This is one of the uh, behavioral barriers uh, in the industrial parks. Uh, so most of the industrial parks, they purchase, uh, you know, equipment to make the measurements and they put it somewhere, but uh, after some point, so they don't want to allocate resources, mostly personal. Uh, you know, they don't want to allocate uh, people to do those measurements and they mainly think that they, they cannot save a lot, uh, you know, using these uh, devices. And uh, if one of the companies in an in, in industrial park start uh, and uh, show that this can uh, be achievable, if they can show this as an example, and then the other companies in the industrial park start uh, doing the same thing. So they, some, so a company in the industrial park should do something, like should, uh, should start these energy efficiency measurements. And then the other, uh, you know, companies follow that. So they think that, uh, you know, uh, the energy efficiency, uh, the energy prices uh, are kind of cheap and they, they don't take, you know, even if they uh, invest in, in this type of, uh, you know, investments, they cannot save a lot. So they, they it's not just, uh, you know, economic reasons, but it's just like behavioral, uh, you know, barrier. So they, they I think uh, industrial zone management should encourage them uh, to uh, do such, uh, you know, uh, studies uh, and they teach, they should teach them and they, and, uh, you know, talk with them and educate them uh, in order to start such things in, in industrial parks. Okay, um, thank you. But after hearing the um, presentation of Neil, um, just to want <laughs> a personal opinion from you, um, do you think it is also interesting for a Turkish industrial park? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, my my plan is to talk with Niels after the, after this presentation because we are looking at more more uh, industrial parks, uh, you know, follower parks in our project. So I will invite uh, Niels to, you know, uh, join our activities in SPARS project. So I think this is very interesting. And uh, we have a couple industrial parks in Turkey uh, doing this, uh, this type of things. In one of them, for example, uh, they have some, uh, you know, uh, natural gas power plants inside the, inside the industrial parks and they have excess uh, water vapor, so we ex excess vapor. And there is another uh, uh, industry in the same industrial parks. Uh, they need water vapor for packaging. So they basically uh, established an, um, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, vapor grids inside the park so they can, um, you know, uh, use that excess uh, vapor to uh, to distribute to uh, the other uh, companies that they need for for packaging. So there are some examples, but uh, not uh, not at the scale that Niels uh, was mentioning in his presentation. So this is this is a, this is a great example actually. So you're doing like uh, you know uh, you know exchanging electricity and you know other things so this uh, uh, in a much larger scale so we don't have that uh, that that a big scale in turkey so this is an interesting example i think we can learn a lot from uh, from uh, Neil's uh, example so I, i'm pretty i'm curious yeah uh, likewise uh, I, I think we will learn a lot from from your your experience from your industrial park so so please, uh, please uh, contact me uh, sure. uh, and, and we can discuss further.
Yeah, yeah, thank you. I'll do that. Okay, Gulkan. Um, I still have another question for you um, because yeah. some other questions for all these presenters that just came in. Um, but I'll just start with you here. And um, with all the years of experience of OIZ in Turkey, what have been the main lessons you have been able to give to your other European partners in ESPA? Uh, you, you mean what we learned from uh, the Turkish organizations and industries? Okay. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the management of industrial parks is an important uh, in, in problem. So, uh, for example, some of the parks that we visited in Austria, and they had this, uh, you know, the, some of the land in, in, the, in the industrial parks is owned by, you know, private owners. And that's sometimes a big problem because this, or most of the organized industrial zones uh after after the establishment after let's say like five years they want to uh, double their uh, their area you know they, because this is uh, the big uh, attraction and uh, to other uh, industries and uh, let's say they start with like 10 industries and in in five years they become 100 so they they need more land and if you cannot manage uh, the purchasing new land in a in a good way, then uh, you are stuck. So you cannot uh, continue the operations because in Turkey uh, the land is actually uh, provided to organ organized industrial zones by government, and the ones uh, the, they establish uh, the organized industrial zones, the main uh, income for organized industrial zones is selling this land to the newcomers so this is a big uh, big advantage so uh, and uh, imagine if this land is gone, uh, owned by the private uh, you know uh, entities then th it would this would become a big problem because you you will have you need to negotiate and then is this whole process will become very long and then you cannot uh, enlarge your organized industry resources uh, second thing is that uh, I think uh, in terms of joint energy services, uh, organized industrial zones have a big power in Turkey because they, they are distribution company and then they can easily uh, make uh, agreements, different kind of agreements, and they have lots of flexibility, I, I should say, and the, the laws, uh, they, they allow this. And, um, and now, uh, as as I offered in my uh, presentation, we have some problems with natural gas and electricity, but I think they will also, uh, you know, most of them will uh, start up, uh, you know, uh, wholesale trading companies, and then they will solve also this problem. So uh, I think there are also problems, of course, because uh, you know, uh, if you have excess energy in your industrial zones. And if you are uh, near, uh, you know, a, a village, let's say, and if you will, would like to, uh, you know, uh, sell your excess energy to, uh, to, to a city next to you, it's not possible. Uh, so there are some regulations prohibiting. So the looking at from other perspectives, so industrial ports are in Turkey are they're, they're very close. They have borders and they don't want to, it's not easy to exchange things uh, through their borders easily. So that's a big problem. So there are some issues that we need to solve, but uh, I think in terms of ownership and the management structure, uh, we have a big uh, flexibility because it's like, uh, it's, um, uh, it's managed by like public and private partnerships. So uh, I think that's a, that's a good model. We think that it's a good model. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The information about the um, yeah characteristics of Turkish industrial parks. Yeah. Now I have a question uh, for Niels. Using the waste heat from the data centers is an awesome start, but what work has been done to improve the energy performance of the data centers themselves? Is there an approach being explored? 
Yes, uh, actually, actually um, the, um, the Horizon 2020 project uh, called Woden Type Data Center has, is focusing on being en more energy efficient, um, so, which, which uh, actually some of the uh, data center investors who are in the, region, in the, in the area are applying but but the whole whole idea around that is how can you optimize the airflow to maintain the chip temperature of of a, of a chip in the server and and the optimal temperature will determine the the airflow so so what that project has done is it it's a kind of a artificial intelligence uh, uh, airflow controlling system. So, so, so we will optimize the amount of operations per watt or whatever it is. So, so, so this, this has led to a, a call uh, to, for action towards the, towards the, uh, server manufacturers um, that they should open up their uh, APIs, the, the application programming interfaces for the, uh, for the uh, um, server fans. So the server fans can talk to the, the cooling units uh, and, and in that sense optimize the energy efficiency uh, tricks. So this is this is what we've been doing research, and and now already some of the data centers that are in this region are applying that that know-how. Okay, thanks. Um, I still have some other questions, but I think if I look at the time, um, this one should be the best to choose. Um, it is for Niels and Gokan. Um, where would standardization facilitate greater intercompany cooperation? For example, energy material purchase contracts, risk assessment, um, sharing approaches, etc. Um, uh, I, I, I didn't really catch the question, sorry. Um, so where would standardization facilitate greater intercompany cooperation? Um, Examples are energy purchase or material purchase contracts, or um, something like risk assessment sharing approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, what we've seen is that uh, because these sectors are not used to uh, to cooperate with between each other, um, there is there is. Uh, there, there has to be some some form of uh, uh, how, how shall I call it help, but but maybe maybe I should take that question offline from my side at least, uh, so I can think about it. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I I I think the contracts are very important um, because. Um, you know, uh, once you are in the organized industrial zones, you need to uh, follow some rules. It's not easy for, uh, you know, companies to share things and you need to find the, uh, you know, uh, you know, to you know, set some rules for, for this one to happen. And the organized industrial zone management should also agree because they, they you know, uh, they would like to control uh, most of the things happening in, in their borders. And uh, I think uh, another barrier uh, that we observe in the industrial zones and uh, these companies, they do not know each other very well. So they, do, they usually, um, you know, come to industrial zones and they, uh, you know, produce something, they do some activity but they don't know what's going on uh, with the next company next door. So they, they, they don't know what, how much uh, energy they consume, uh, what, is the, what do they have in excess and how they can benefit 
from them. So they, I think uh, it's important to sit down on around the table and these companies should talk with each other and uh, they should, uh, you know, uh, explain their needs and uh, what do they need, what do, what do they have in excess and how do they can cooperate with each other. So that's, that's a very important, uh, you know, starting point. And they, this, this uh, doesn't happen uh, often in, in industrial zones. I think uh, this is an important barrier. But after that, yes, uh, uh, purchase contracts are important. And, um, you know, so you need to put this in a contracts in order that to work. So thank you. Okay, um, thank you. I think uh, as a industrial park management uh, institution organization, there are still potentials left. Um, thank you for that interesting question. Um, the time is up, I think. Um, so I would like to thank everybody um, for the really interesting in presentations and um, also for the questions. And I also would like to mention that uh, my co-panel leader, Rod, um, he's copying the whole time questions for me from Hoover. So thank you, Rod. And um, yeah, thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this session and also the discussion. And maybe you'll um, like to join us at 2 p.m. Um, to our fourth session, um, Increasing Demand for Financial Services. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.